Ray, good afternoon and, and welcome to the OCC uh, regulator panel for this afternoon's portion of the mutual forum. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. We are really pleased to see so many people participating in this conversation. Um, our goal today is to, to start off with some introductory comments um, and, and then to open it up for questions and answers and a little bit more of a interaction. Um, you know, we think there's value in just hearing from you and, and learning what you would like to hear from us. Um, so I'm going to introduce the representatives from the OCC who will um, play a primary role in today's um, discussion, um, starting with Sydney Menifee, who's our Senior Deputy Controller um, for Midsize and Community Bank Supervision. Um, second uh, will be Donna Murphy, who's our Deputy Controller for Compliance Risk in our Bank Supervision Policy Unit. Um, and then we have three representatives from our district offices. Uh, first is Nathan Perry in our Central District Office. He's an Associate Deputy Controller. Um, second is Ben Rudolph, who is an Associate Deputy Controller in our Western District Office. And then finally is Beverly Cole, who's the, the Deputy Controller in our Northeast District Office. Um, what I would recommend is that you shift your layout to um, let me see, Shannon. I don't know if you can if you can highlight the other OCC speakers um, so that it'll lock the view on them while we do our introductory comments. I'd appreciate that. And um, and while Shannon's working on that, um, I thought I'd give you just an overview of of where things stand as we're approaching the 10 year anniversary of the integration of the OTS into the OCC. Um, if you look back, it's um, at the history of, of the agencies, um, it's hard to believe that that much time has passed, but at the point of integration in July of 2011, the OCC supervised 219 um, what we would call pure mutual federal savings associations. So that's mutual federal savings associations that either do not have a holding company or have a mutual holding company. Um, Ten years later, that population has been reduced roughly in half. We supervise 106 uh, pure mutual savings associations. Um, I'm sorry, 113 peer mutual savings associations, 106 are, are no longer operating. Um, largely that, that contraction mimics what's going on in the community bank space. Um, you know, as I mentioned, out of the, the, the mutuals that we supervise, 113 are pure mutual federal savings associations. If you're expanding the definition of what a mutual is to include stock savings associations and mutual holding companies, there's an additional 25 stock federal savings associations that operate in a mutual holding company structure. Um, so we feel like with the contraction in the industry, the mutual industry remains a relevant portion of the OCC portfolio um, and a significant part of our supervision efforts within midsize and community bank supervision. I wanted to highlight a few of the um, key issues that we've talked about over the course of the last several years when we've hosted these mutual forums and through the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee. Um, first and probably largely on people's minds because of the Federal Reserve segment today, um, but they, they discovered um, or discussed the Covered Savings Association regulation in some depth um, during their breakout session at lunchtime. Just to give you all an update on the Covered Savings Association regulation and the number of banks who have adopted um, the Covered Savings Association eligibility. Um, 21 banks to date have adopted becoming a Covered Savings Association um, as of March 31st, 2021. Roughly half of them, just over half of them, 57% uh, of those Covered Savings Associations are mutual charters. So we're pleased to see that people are leveraging the opportunity that was intended to reduce regulatory burden and allow additional flexibility for mutual savings associations and federal savings associations to expand their lending authority and engage and activities above and beyond that that are permissible for a, a federal savings association. Um, we're pleased to report that the mutual savings association industry, um, the federal mutual savings association industry remains very strong, um, even compared to their community bank peers. 100% of mutual FSAs today are well capitalized per prompt corrective action. Um, when we look across the risk assessment of the mutual population, um, strategic and operational risks remain the two highest risks facing mutual FSAs, um, largely because of the challenges that exist with strategic planning in today's economic environment. Um, obviously, all banks are experiencing some net interest margin contraction um, and dealing with the ramifications of the pandemic. Um, in reaction to that, they've had to make some adjustments to their, their balance sheets in order to accommodate what's going on in the economy and what's going on in the world. Um, but by and throughout all, despite the risk being elevated, the performance continues to, to remain high. 
Um, the volume of MRAs cited against mutual uh, federal savings associations in the last 12 months has actually declined by 39%. So we're down to 252 MRAs system-wide for all mutual savings associations from the same period last year. Um, the, the most um, Concentrated areas of, of, of matters requiring attention are in bank information technology. Um, obviously, as you all recall from today's session on cybersecurity, that's obviously a very compelling and real risk facing the banking system, so it's no surprise that bank information technology concerns are, are high. Um, but what I'm happy to report is that that population of MRAs has reduced year over year and has actually declined um, since, since the prior year. Um, the second most prevalent um, um, matter requiring attention for mutual savings associations affects the capital markets area. Um, it's about 17% of all outstanding matters requiring attention. Um, and then the third position is commercial credit at about 15% of all concerns. Um, Capital markets probably saw the biggest increase year over year um, in concerns cited, largely because of the shifts that are happening um, within banks' balance sheets. Um, a lot of banks have elected to look towards investment portfolio changes in order to compensate for um, the inflow of deposits they've received and trying to, to bring on some, some interest-earning assets. So um, nothing unexpected. And again, I think the progress that I would you know, view as being the most productive is the, the progress in reducing information technology, MRAs, um, we're down you know. 53 concerns over the past year in total volume of MRAs facing um, mutual savings associations. I previously mentioned that all mutuals um, within the system are well capitalized, but I thought it may be good to provide a little bit more context beyond that. Um, when you look at the mutual federal savings association population, the medium, median leverage ratio is, is solid. It's at 14.4%, um, and it fell 16 basis points, largely due to growth that occurred because mutual bankers have participated so strongly in the PPP lending program. Um, it, it remains well above the state chartered median of 11.8%. So collectively, the mutual federal savings association population has stronger capital um, than your state-run regulated counterparts. And out of the population of mutuals that we supervise, 62 um, or 45 percent of the mutual FSAs opted into the CBLR framework um, and are now using that as their, as their guide for how they calculate capital adequacy. Transitioning just slightly to talk a little bit about asset quality because we've all experienced a, a somewhat unconventional year with the pandemic and the ramifications of the pandemic. Our total past due loans amongst the mutual population have continued to improve and fell five basis points to what we would consider a decade low, 0.56%. Um, that's incredible considering where we thought we would be today. Um, keep in mind that we have to take that with a grain of salt because while the past due levels remain low, there's still a lot of um, modifications and government stimulus that are potentially masking risk that's out there and delinquencies for some credits. Um, so when the comptroller spoke earlier today of uh, making sure that we avoid complacency, that's, that's exactly what he's talking about, is paying attention to what's going on, noticing trends, and, and, and reacting if you start to see deterioration materialize as some of these government stimulus programs unwind. The only other thing I would focus on briefly is liquidity. I know we talked this morning at the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee. Um, while there were 10 of you there as members of the committee, most of you didn't have the benefit of that conversation. But we did um, talk quite a bit about liquidity and the inflow of deposits that have happened as a result of um, the stimulus checks, PPP funds, and other reasons um, associated with the pandemic. Uh, mutuals are obviously flush with liquidity as a result of those. Um, the on-hand liquidity ratio for mutual FSAs um, it broke above 30 percent um, due to those those inflows of pandemic-related deposits, and it's anyone's guess as to when those will start to run off or, or customers will start to behave di differently. Um, but it does create some really big challenges for bankers as they try to consider whether these are permanent inflows and whether you should start planning to operate under this new balance sheet structure that you found yourself um, encountering. So that's just some high-level insights into what's going on with the Mutual Savings Association um, population right now. Um, I think the, the highlights of what we discussed this morning in the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee, first, I would recommend any mutual that is interested should go to the OCC's website. There's a public record of the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee, the topical areas that the representative members bring to the table. Um, and I think one of the, the most compelling things that the Comptroller committed to this morning is a, is a, a commitment to transparency in terms of um, conveying our policies and standards relative to transactions that come to our licensing um, process. So. 
um, as an OCC, we are going to echo that commitment and, and move forward with creating more transparency around transactions, um, specifically affecting mutual savings associations, including voluntary liquidations, um, and, and moving on beyond that, even potentially merger conversions and other, other of those um, novel transactions that tend to occur at various intervals through the economic cycle. Um, the focus of our discussion today, while we want it to be interactive, um, we do have um, some subject matter expertise with us in, in having Donna Murphy attend today. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning in, in the introduction, she is our Deputy Controller for Compliance Risk Policy at the OCC. Um, a couple of topic areas that are always on top of mind are what's going on with the Community Reinvestment Act and also what's going on with Bank Secrecy Act. And Donna is going to kick us off today by giving a little bit of an overview on where we stand on both of those topics. Um, Donna is only going to be able to be with us for the beginning of today's panel discussion, so we wanted to front load the conversation with consumer compliance and other related topics so we could leverage her expertise. So I'm going to turn it over to Donna to kick us off and give us those updates before we open it up for general questions. So thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Uh, to give a little update on some of the areas, uh, policy areas that are on um, within my team. Um, I'm going to focus on the BSA and the Community Reinvestment Act, but also, um, you know, we cover consumer protection and those and fair lending as well. So if people have questions, um, please feel free to to send to ask those or send those to me um, as we're going along. Um, so I'll start out with BSA because there's just been a lot going on in BSA over the last year or so. Um, of course, you know, top of mind has been adjusting to uh, and through the, the COVID pandemic and everything that's meant um, in the BSA area, um, as well as, of course, consumer protection and other areas as well. But, um, I mean, from a compliance perspective, I can say that overall, bankers and, and OCC examiners have demonstrated real resilience and adaptability to um, teleworking and adjusting to all the changes that have occurred in the financial services industry during the pandemic. Um, so we've been really, um, you know, uh, really pleased that we've been able to work with our uh, OCC supervised institutions on that. Um, early on in the pandemic, the OCC issued a series of guidance documents um, that clarified our approach to compliance supervision during the pandemic. Um, and in the BSA area in particular, uh, FinCEN issued some uh, guidance and then the OCC, we followed on to that uh, to make very clear to institutions that we recognize the stresses and challenges and that, but that to strongly encourage that if there were, uh, you know, difficulties in meeting deadlines or specific BSA requirements during the pandemic to communicate early with us so that, um, you know, we, the OCC and FinCEN were aware of the institution's plans and that I think worked, um, worked pretty well, um, really. Um, from a supervision perspective, we had some initial disruptions to our uh, BSA supervisory activities. Um, but basically by about this time last year, or maybe a little later last year, we were back to um, more of a sort of business as usual kind of schedule, albeit working remotely. Um, uh, and that's actually, the working remotely has been uh, one particular challenge in the BSA area is both um, financial institutions, our supervised institutions, and our supervisory offices have had to really focus on information security concerns pertaining to suspicious activity reports and handling of those, um, ensuring that appropriate precautions are in place, when SARS have to be developed, filed, reviewed, um, when people are working at home uh, rather than in their offices. And I think we've um, had some focus on that from a supervisory perspective, and certainly if there's, um, you know, our remaining questions or concerns about that, we encourage institutions to reach out to your, to your supervisory office, to your portfolio manager, and, and talk about those, because it's really obviously critical that we maintain the um, security, information security in that area. Um, so switching from uh, sort of the pandemic focused area, uh, we've also been continuing with the effort that was begun before it started uh, to really clarify, work with the other agencies, FinCEN and the other federal banking agencies and the NCUA, to really clarify uh, the risk-focused approach to BSA supervision, um, both through a series of interagency statements and through updates to the uh, FFIEC BSA examination manual. Um, so just to highlight a couple of things that have happened over the last year, um, uh, in last summer, August, we issued with the other FBAs and FinCEN 
a joint statement on addressing um, politically exposed persons uh, and making clear uh, how, for financial institutions, how those the BSA regulatory requirements for customers, um, particularly customer due diligence, relate to this category that that you know politically exposed persons uh, are you know may exhibit uh, risk high risk characteristics, but they may not. Um, so the key point of this statement is that um, PEPs should be um, addressed on a risk focused risk based approach for conducting customer due diligence, and not all PEPs are high risk. Um, the statement also, of course, distinguishes the very specific legal requirements that relate to senior foreign political figures, which is a, a generally a subset of the people of the customers are considered pets. So that's uh, we, we have gotten feedback that that's been helpful, hopefully, um, to some of your institutions as well. Um, similarly, in November of last year, we issued um, what we called the Cherry Fact Sheet. Uh, it was a joint uh, fact sheet from the FinCEN and the SBAs, again, that um, really recognized the important role of charities and other nonprofit organizations. I was really prompted by um, some of those organizations um, attempting to do work during the pandemic and sometimes um, running into difficulties with uh, receiving financial services um, uh, on an international basis. But it also applies to uh, domestic charities and, again, emphasizes that customer due diligence for those or for those customers should be applied on a risk basis and that not all charities or other uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, are high risk. Um, and so hopefully those two statements uh, have been, if you're, aware of, if you're not aware of them, they're available on OCC.gov on our webpage um, and um, with bulletins issued by the OCC to provide that kind of clarification um, on our supervision. Uh, we also work with the other SBAs uh, to update an enforcement statement that has been out uh, there for, for many years, for about 15 years. And just to that was just to clarify, it didn't signal any new enforcement efforts or initiatives, but it, it had gotten outdated um, over the years, and we wanted to really clarify um, how the agencies approached the requirements um, in our regulations regarding BSA enforcement. Um, again, that's available on our webpage. If, uh, or if people have questions, I'd be happy to address them. Um, another uh, uh, focus over the last year has been updating the BSA manual, and um, some of you may be probably aware of this. Um, we last April issued um, uh, reissued the beginning sections of the manual, which are sort of the overview sections, to really clarify and integrate fully the risk-based approach to BSA examination into the manual um, so that it, it's very clear um, both to, you know, all of your institutions as well as uh, to our examiners, there's clear guidance on how, um, those, how, how the risk-based approach should be applied in BSA examinations. Also, um, those updates incorporated uh, the encouragement that the agencies have given to agent, uh, institutions to consider uh, where appropriate, uh, innovative approaches to BSA AML. And, um, some of you may have worked with our Office of Innovation at the OCC. Uh, we work closely with that office to uh, provide uh, information and support uh, for institutions that are considering, um, you know, whether it's adopting new technology, uh, partnering with a third-party FinTech type organization or other approaches to innovation. Um, with respect to the manual, we are proceeding with the update progress project. Uh, and are basically issuing uh, additional updates to the manual on what we call an, sort of an incremental basis. Um, so on February 25th, and then again on June 21st, we issued each time four additional updated sections of the manual addressing various regulatory requirements. We're continuing to work on this project, and we're focusing now on updating some sections of the manual that have been impacted by the interagency statements I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, and then we expect to turn to updates from the AML Act. And uh, so the AML Act is, of course, another huge, uh, huge change in the BSA world. Um, uh, it was implemented, I guess it was finalized, finally adopted by Congress uh, on January 4th, 2021, but it's called the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020. There's also the Corporate Transparency Act of 2020. And it would take me the entire hour to go through all the provisions of, this, of the act, um, 
that are uh, included in this really comprehensive legislation, but it really is um, a, a change in uh, the approach to, B to BSA and to anti-money laundering um, for the U.S. system overall, the BSA regime. Um, some of the key things that uh, you're going to be seeing very, very soon um, are that one of the big purposes of the BSA have been expanded to officially recognize counterterrorist financing. For a long time, we've um, implemented that implemented that sort of as a matter of practice, but it's now been incorporated into those statutes. Um, also, uh, FinCEN uh, and the Department of Treasury, working with all of their agency partners across law enforcement and the regulators, have been developing a set of national priorities for uh, any money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. And those priorities are going to actually be published very, very soon. They are due 180 days after implementation of the Act, which happens to occur tomorrow. Um, and uh, those priorities are going to be published as sort of a list. And so um, they will then be followed by, <clears throat> as, as prescribed by the Anti-Money Laundering Act, uh, new regulations. So sort of by the end of this year, the beginning of next year, you'll start to see some regulatory changes. Uh, but for now, um, and uh, when the priorities come out, the uh, federal banking agencies and FinCEN will actually issue a statement in conjunction with them that makes very clear that there's no immediate action that's required by the publication of these priorities. But, you know, institutions, all your institutions should start looking at them and, um, you know, uh, identifying those that are relevant to your institution's business model and risk profile. Um, and, and then there will be regulations, first the proposed rule, and then final regulation changes will follow um, later in the year probably. So that's a big change. Um, the other uh, sort of biggest uh, headline, I guess, here will be that very uh, since then earlier this year issued an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, related to the Corporate Transparency Act. This is the requirement that Congress has placed on FinCEN to uh, develop a beneficial ownership registry. Um, so um, corporations will have to, uh, you know, certain corporations, um, there are some exceptions, well, but uh, certain corporations will have to register with FinCEN and provide their beneficial ownership. So um, uh, that is going to be a big project for FinCEN to establish and run that registry. Um, this initial rulemaking is designed, will be designed to, to implement that. And then once the registry is implemented, again, probably next year, FinCEN will then engage in rulemaking to um, adapt the its beneficial ownership rule that applies to, you know, all your institutions right now. That will be adapted to, to work with the beneficial ownership registry. Um, and that, you know, but that's, again, forthcoming regulation. Um, there's also provisions related to support for technology, for information sharing, for training, for, um, uh, inf you know, security of, of, of SARS and other BSA data, just a whole, whole um, you know, number of, of Anti-Money Laundering Act provisions that will be implemented over the next several years. And the OCC and the other SBAs are working very closely with FinCEN on the development of all these various areas. So that's, I'm going to stop there for BSA, um, and, uh, but certainly happy to answer any questions that, uh, I can, that, that you all may have. Um, I, we'll turn for a minute to the status of the Community Reinvestment Act rule. Um, as uh, most of you probably know, uh, last June, the OCC published a final rule to modernize the agency's regulation under the CRA. Um, and uh, some of those provisions of that rule were effective. They had a compliance date last October and have been implemented. Uh, those provisions primarily include um, qualifying activities criteria, um, both, uh, both lending and, and community development related, um, a qualifying activities list and confirmation system, uh, changes to the asset size for bank types, um, and uh, other definitions and strategic plans. Um, those are some of the major changes. Those changes are continuing to be implemented. But on May 18th, the Acting Comptroller did announce that the OCC is reviewing and reconsidering the June 2020 rule. So with this reconsideration going on, um, we are 
as I said, continuing to implement those provisions that went into effect in, Oct on, in October. Um, uh, but we have paused on the implementation and um, have made clear that we will not object to uh, our supervised institutions pausing on implementation of provisions that had a compliance date of January 2023 or 2024. In other words, the provisions that haven't gone into effect yet are sort of paused. The ones that did go into effect, we are continuing to implement unless and until further rulemaking occurs. Um, and with regard to those provisions that are, are in effect and, and continuing, um, we've issued two bulletins, one in November 2020 uh, and then one in January to implement those provisions. Um, those are also available on our OCC.gov website. Um, or you know, if people have questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Um, so that's the, and, and then basically this review and reconsideration is ongoing. Uh, we are looking to determine how to you know, uh, uh, provide recommendations to the acting comptroller who will make a decision about how to um, you know, uh, move forward in the way that uh, is true to the purposes of the CRA and hopefully is, um, it provides for an orderly uh, transition to whatever is the, are the next steps. Um, we also expect that there will be additional opportunities for uh, stakeholder input, uh, as well as, you know, as we evaluate the issues and the questions that have been raised. Um, so that's pretty much what I was going to say as an overview. Um, uh, I guess I could take questions. Um, or, uh, yeah, and so for everyone on the line, you're welcome to submit your questions directly into the chat, or if you use the raise hand icon, um, which is next to your name, you're also welcome to do that and ask the question verbally. Um, we'll monitor for people who raise their hands and, and, and call on them so we can kind of keep some order to how the questions come in. Um, but either format is acceptable if you'd rather type it in versus if you'd rather um, um, speak directly to us. Um, and as you're thinking about questions related to CRA, BSA, or consumer compliance, you're also welcome to um, submit questions relative to any other supervision topic that you want to tee up for discussion. Um, we do want this to be interactive, and we want to be able to talk about issues that are relevant to you as, as the bankers. Um, so, so even if you want to just submit topic areas to hear what's going on, you can, you're welcome to do that as well. So I'm not seeing any questions coming in on CRA or BSA. Um, I guess you did too good of a job, Donna. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot going on, but uh, but on the CRA front, certainly more to come. Um, and uh, calls on BSA. And from the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee meeting this morning, we had the acting comptroller come and speak to the group of bankers, um, and, and very much at the high level, he did talk about CRA and his goal to um, work collaboratively with the other federal regulatory agencies to understand if we can um, move forward together on, on how the modernization and reform of CRA will work. So I know Donna and her group is going to be doing a lot of work in regards to that evolution, both assessing where we are and, and where we need to get to. So um, we obviously appreciate the, the work they've already done to this point. And um, I think the partnership we have with our bankers is also critically important in understanding um, what we got right or what were pressure points or pain points for you in terms of how the, the rule itself came out. So um, your feedback is also critically important as we, as we consider our next steps in this, in this area. Okay, that, that's, a great, that's a great point, Mike. Um, as many of you may know, the Federal Reserve Board issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking relating to CRA last fall, and um, we have been meeting with my team and meeting with their staff about the comments that they got back in response to that um, that ANPR. But um, as, as I did mention, I expect that there will be 
formal opportunities, but um, certainly uh, informal input we get, you know, we do get regularly um, both from our, our uh, co my colleagues in supervision and, um, you know, also directly to our, our us in policy um, comments from, from the institutions that are actually implementing this rule. And that, that is, has been invaluable and has very much influenced, um, you know, how we're proceeding with implementation and also with, um, you know, with some of the questions that have come up now. So please, please continue to let us know what's going on and how it's working. Okay. One last opportunity to ask questions for Donna before we shift focus and, and start talking a little bit more about direct supervision within MCBS. Well, thank, you. thank you again uh, to everybody who's uh, to uh, you know, the whole team organizing this uh, for the opportunity to speak to all of you, and I hope you all have a good afternoon. Thanks, Donna. So for the remainder of today's session, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we invited several of our district representatives to come and speak with you on issues going on within district um, supervision. Um, obviously, I'm here in my role as the Deputy Controller for Thrift Supervision, responsible for the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee, um, and really a lot of the overarching policy issues that arise relative to the thrift industry. Um, you know, Sydney Menifee, as our, as our, um, our Senior Deputy Controller oversees all of our district operations as well as thrift supervision and special supervision, which is our problem bank unit. Um, and we do have, um, you know, three, three valuable members of that team, Beverly Cole, uh, Ben Rudolph, and um, Nathan Perry here with us today. Um, I will open it up for, for, for Ben, um, Nathan, or Beverly, if you have any pressing issues that you want to raise from district supervision perspective, um, or Sydney, obviously, if you have an issue that you'd like to tee up for discussion, we're, we'd welcome that as well. and I took our phones off mute at the same time. <laughs> I saw her move. Um, maybe I'll just take a minute to uh, maybe reiterate some of the comments uh, from our, our previous session with the advisory committee that we, we really do appreciate your participation in this event and the feedback that we get from you is very valuable to us and we do use it uh, to, to guide our supervisory strategies and how we think about um, our supervision and think about policies or practices that we, that we might need to tailor or rethink. So we do really appreciate and value the feedback that you're getting, that you give us in these types of forums. So uh, don't be shy, raise your hand, uh, submit, submit your questions through the chat. Your questions um, tell us what's on top of your, top of your mind, so they're, they're very informative and, and let us know where we need to focus our attention as well. Uh, and it's really important to us because uh, mutual charters are very important to us, and we understand that you're, you do have a unique aspects to your, uh, to, to your charter, and that needs to be taken into consideration. So um, if there's any issue that, that you'd like to, to bring up, we, we do encourage you to raise your hand or type your question in the chat, which sometimes is a little bit easier uh, for, for those of us that might be a little shy. So I do encourage you to, to raise your issues and ask your questions. And then Ben and Beverly, Nathan, if you have anything that you wanted to add, I'll turn it over to you. This is Beverly Cole. Good afternoon, everybody. I just want to reiterate what um, and enforce what um, Sydney just said about the importance of the mutual charter. I know in the Northeast District, a significant amount of the portfolio that I'm responsible for supervising is composed of uh, federal savings associations as well as mutual institutions. And I'm really pleased to have all of you um, be part of uh, being supervised by the OCC. And we want to do uh, things that are conducive uh, to you remaining. Uh, with the OCC and supervised by the OCC. So I, I'm new to the district relatively. I arrived, unfortunately, right about the time that the pandemic took place and we were relegated to working from home. 
So many of you I've not been able to meet in person, but I do look forward to the day when we have in-person meetings again and or when I can get around the district in the Northeast District and meet uh, many of you face-to-face. -face. So thank you. There's not a lot of questions or topics coming in on the chat. There's a few areas that we can cover, and, and, and like I said, if, if you guys want to redirect us, you're welcome to. But I thought I would start by teeing up the conversation on what we're doing relative to supervision um, as we're kind of exiting the pandemic and the lockdown, how we're approaching bank examinations going forward, kind of our lessons learned from, um, from the last year of having to do remote examination work and what you can expect going forward. Um, the OCC's operating posture internally has not changed and will remain unchanged until um, after Labor Day when we make a decision about whether we want to move away from our enhanced telework posture. Um, but we are starting to do more work on site at financial institutions, largely in step and in alignment with the, the bank's policies on the pandemic and their comfort level with having people travel in or um, be located within their, their bank. Um, we have greatly missed the idea of being face-to-face -face and having um, direct interaction, but we know a result of the pandemic will be that there is probably a hybrid solution that is, is probably the most workable where we will continue to do a, a chunk of work off-site and then allow time on-site for key meetings, interactions with bank, um, you know, key bank personnel or to top talk about specific sensitive issues or concerns that are arising as a result of the examination. Um, we are going to be curious to hear from you as we kind of move from the lockdown posture back to a more in-person approach to examinations as to what works and what doesn't work because I think the shared experience of what we've learned over the last year is going to be really important in how we strike that balance of what should be on-site versus what should be off-site work. There's been a classic argument that's gone on within mid-sized community bank supervision over the value of that direct interaction action versus things that we can do without disrupting the flow of the bank's operations and taking time and attention away from your staff, which is obviously going to be um, heavily engaged in their day jobs and don't always have the time to, to entertain uh, thousands of questions from bank examiners while they're on site. So achieving that balance is going to be critically important to us. Um, many of you have probably already experienced some of the return to on-site examination work and over the course of the next several months, you will likely, in coordination with your portfolio manager, have those kinds of, those kinds of conversations. I would be curious to hear from, from any of the bankers in attendance today whether you have any concerns um, merging, merging out of the pandemic as we, as we reintegrate ourselves into your banks or if there are any you know, lessons you have or have learned that you would like to pass along to us. So that's one potential topic area. And again, I, you know, submit any thoughts in the chat or raise your hand and we can, we can call on you to, to, to address the topic. Um, the, the second area that came up in this morning's conversation on the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee is in also a, a pandemic-related topic, but um, very specific to the community bank leverage rule and kind of the ongoing pressure that banks are feeling um, relative to their balance sheets um, and, and maintaining compliance with the CBLR minimums given the deposit influence, given the deposit inflow and flows and the decision making involved in whether you try to enter into new investment activities or new types of lending in order to deploy that, um, that cash into earning assets. Um, so that'll be a topic of conversations that we want, that we want to learn from you as bankers on. Um, you know, as you're all aware, during the pandemic, we published guidance on kind of the short-term impact if you have these deposit influence, what would happen um, over the course of, of time as they, as they uh, roll back out. Um, for many of you, the, the rollout has not occurred and some of those deposits have proven to be quite sticky. And so you're faced with some conundrums about how you restructure your balance sheet to accommodate that activity. Um, so we're going to be paying a lot of attention when we come in to do exams of, of what's going on with your balance sheets, how you're making the risk selection and risk decisions about where you deploy those funds um, and, and how you, you know, continue to earn money um, both locally and then through investments or other opportunities that arise. Um, but the, the specific question that came up this morning in the Mutual Advisory Committee was whether there'd be additional guidance from the OCC on kind of the, the, the six-month, nine-month, 12-month after the fact um, activities that occur. Um, and we don't have plans to issue additional guidance absent hearing directly from the industry that there is a need for it. Um, the idea would be that as, as your balance sheets continue to mature and evolve, you would recognize what is, is more likely to be a permanent change versus what is a temporary change associated with PPP or the, the, um, the inflow of deposit 
deposits that resulted due to, to stimulus checks or other things during the pandemic. Um, so again, an opportunity for you to provide us feedback as we come in and do your examinations or in context of today's conversation um, would be really helpful for us as well. And I can keep going. I've got a laundry list of things we can cover. <laughs> I'm going to keep pausing, though, just to, to see if anyone does have any questions or any topics they'd like us to, to focus in on. I see, uh, Annette, you raised your hand. So if I you did. Like to... Yeah, just a couple of comments. One, as far as the examination is concerned, I think it is great to have that hybrid option because it is so much more efficient. However, I do think it's important that the exam teams get out and see the communities that we're operating in because I think that does have a big influence on some of the underlying reasons behind why we offer the products and services the way we do. Um, and then just in relation to the pandemic and moving forward, our asset quality is better than it's ever been. However, we continue to incorporate a qualitative factor in our allowance calculation in the event that we do start seeing deterior deterioration in our portfolio. And in my last conversation with our examiner in charge, she kind of indicated that until we are really through and have a high comfort level that they would be okay with us maintaining that COVID qualitative factor. And I guess I just kind of wanted to get a feel if that's sort of the, the, the overall sense for all of the districts or if they will look at it sort of on a geographic type basis as far as what is going to be allowed going forward. So yeah, um, we're fortunate in that Sydney is our former chief accountant and knows quite a bit about accounting and allowance methodology, so I know she'll have some thoughts on this, but I, I do think when you make a decision about the qualitative factors you use in your allowance methodology, obviously it has to be based on, on the reality of where you think your exposures are, and I think as more time passes, there may be less and less of an argument to maintain that kind of a qualitative adjustment if it doesn't pan out where it does produce some additional deterioration in your portfolio. Um, I think when you talk with your examiners, they are, they are interacting with our our accounting staff and they typically are, are vetting those questions. So the, the, the greater the volume of those questions that arise, the more in tuned our accounting staff becomes to the issue and more likely they are to issue interpretive guidance that would um, that would be given to all of our examiners so we would be consistent across our district offices. Um, I don't know if, if Sydney, if you have thoughts you want to offer specifically on that topic or obviously if Beverly or Ben or, or Nathan have thoughts if you've heard it directly through your districts. Well, maybe it's an... an from a MCBS response, uh, you know, this qualitative factor should really be reflective of your your institution and, and the particular you know, methodology that you've employed. Uh, so I, I, there's not a, a national position or a district position uh, or a field office position. I think it really depends on you know, your particular institution, and I think that goes back to your original comment about why it is important for your examiners to have some type of you know, understanding of, of the market that you're operating in because that qualitative factor will be influenced by your customer base and where you're located, and that's not going to apply necessarily to an institution 50 miles down the road. So um, I think it is very institution specific, and you know, there can't be, it's not a one-size-fits-all, particularly when you get to those qualitative factors. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of other hot topic areas that have come up, um, particularly in relation to some of the banker outreach we've done, and I'm curious as to whether that is a topic that the, the mutuals in attendance today would like to hear more about. But the first is, is climate change. Um, that's obviously one of the things that the acting comptroller um, articulated as one of his key priorities. Is that a topic area where you as, as mutuals feel like you need some preliminary guidance or some direction on what it is that the regulatory agencies are contemplating, or do you feel like you've got enough information today on how the administration is approaching climate change and what it means for the banking industry? I 
and maybe to put a little bit of context as you're thinking, um, the acting comptroller has really has really framed this up as a risk management discussion. Um, you know, there's there's the political side of climate change, and I think that will be that will be fought in Congress and, and amongst the legislators. Um, but the the practical side of it, which is the risk management piece of it, you know, banks today are exposed to risk as a result of extreme weather, which is one of the byproducts of of climate change. And so, if you look back 20 years ago at how you approached risk management around flood insurance or hurricane insurance or even insurance relative to forest fires or other natural disasters, you probably had a different posture when it came to risk management and the standards by which you would require to have various insurance products or other sorts of mitigants in place in order to compensate for that exposure. Um, the, the conversation today is exactly the same. Knowing what we know about conditions today and what we can expect and looking forward 10 years, 20 years into the future, if we continue to have extreme weather events, how will you as a bank manage the concentration risk in places that are exposed to those, those climate changes. Um, and then even within your portfolio, if you have exposures to specific um, industries that are, that are prone to have events that are impacted by things like climate change, how do you address, address that and adapt to it today? You know, I think the, the common example is that many years ago you would not have had a standard policy in some locations that flood insurance is mandatory outside of, um, you know, what's required by FDPA. Um, today many banks are going above and beyond the requirement because they know the risk exposure is there. Um, are there other categories of risk that, you're, that you've become familiar with in your local area that are, that are relevant and important? And that will be a question we're asking is how do you manage risk in the face of, of what we know in terms of climate change based on the science and what we expect based on um, the trends that we've seen over the past several years. And I see at least one comment came in that we definitely need more guidance on what climate change means for banking, particularly community mutual banks. Um, I do think one of the, the biggest concerns that our community banks and mutual banks have is what is the cost of compliance. Um, and I would anticipate there should not be a huge um, cost undertaking here. I don't envision, and again, this is you know me speaking, not not necessarily the view of the agency, but I don't envision having a, a chief you know an, a climate officer at a bank or having to hire a senior executive. I mean, this is part of your, your, your risk operation. So if you already have a CRO or if the chief risk officer is already merged into the responsibility of your president, your CEO, that will function, you know, perfectly well when you look at the, the risk that climate change poses to your institution. Um, so again, I think as an agency, we're committed to this idea that, that your controls need to, to, to be applicable to the size and complexity of your institution, no more, no less. Um, and so hopefully that, that, will, that will translate through as we talk through the implications of climate change and how it affects the banking industry. Um, the one thing that the comptroller has publicly spoken about is this idea that there's not going to be a point in time where we're going to be comfortable saying you have to bank or not bank a certain customer based on their impact on the climate or the environment. Um, we don't intend to go down into the political kind of abyss of this topic. It really is about risk management for us um, and making sure that you understand the risk exposures and the concentrations that you have within your portfolio so you can adapt um, appropriately as, as the situation continues to evolve. Okay, yeah, I see that John Coyne has raised his hand. John, I'll turn it over to you for your question. Yes, thank you, Mr. McQueen. I, you know, and you kind of hit on it in that last statement, but one of the things that's happened out of Wyoming recently is, is against not financing uh, gun manufacturers and ammunition um, carriers. And I was curious where that runs into um, a concept that we um, could choose to do that from a, a banking standpoint, but then run against um, a political statement as much as anything in my mind about um, the financing of those things. I, I think you said it in your very last statement that you don't see um, your office uh, taking a, a political stance in that regards, but how would, I guess, how would the enforcement or lack thereof kind of come into play in those kinds of situations? And, you know, another polarizing point is one of the mega banks in our state also decided that they were no longer going to play in the oil and gas arena, and that has certainly created some upheaval, which has kind of prompted the, the first issue I spoke about. And I was just curious what, what thoughts were from the agency in that regard. Uh, 
I'll give some um, some preliminary thoughts and then see if, if any of our other panelists have anything to, to add to it. But I think, you know, we obviously aren't, aren't putting a rule in place that would require you to bank certain industries at this stage. Again, I would I would put that probably under the more political spectrum of, of decision making that occurs. You know, inherently this does for us come back to risk management. If you don't understand how to lend to the oil and gas industry, you have to make a decision that you do or do not want to lend to that industry. Um, we've kind of viewed that as, you know, the same decision making you would have about entering into commercial real estate or the same decision making you would have about entering, entering into agricultural lending. It's all about do you have the staff and expertise to undertake the risk. Um, and so the same thing under the same approach would apply to newer technologies when it comes to, um, you know, if you, if you choose not to bank oil and gas but you want to get into solar or wind farms, you have to have the expertise to underwrite the risk. Um, and so as a bank, you have to make a business decision about the risk profile you want um, and, the, and the quality of your staff in order to undertake that risk profile. Um, and I, I think in terms of industry focus, we would be agnostic. If you're lending to commercial real estate, we wouldn't want you picking and choosing which commercial entities you, you lend to based on your perception of what is valuable versus what's not valuable from a social perspective. Um, but we recognize decisions you make affect how your community views you as well, and you have to kind of walk a fine line there. Um, and again, to me, it's about risk selection, risk choice, and I don't think that the government, particularly the OCC, should put a heavy hand on telling you who to bank to and who not to bank, as long as it's not in violation of, you know, discrimination rules. I mean, obviously, if it comes down to um, racial discrimination or any other kind of fair lending consideration, we would object to that. Um, but I don't think the same argument has been posed um, based on the type or the nature of the industry that you're banking with. Um, so I don't know if Sydney or anyone who's got more practical experience in the issue coming up in the district has any thoughts on the topic. A couple comments I might add, Mike, is uh, you know I, I think our, our long public uh, stance on this is that we don't tell banks who to bank. Uh, we do uh, tell them how to uh, implement risk management systems, and I think particularly in the community bank space, and which obviously includes uh, mutuals. There is, like Mike mentioned, right? You have to make some some decisions and, and you know how how much risk you want to take on and how much of that risk you can mitigate. And so, if you don't ha if you don't know how to do oil and gas and if you don't know how to do restaurant, then you either have to bring somebody in that does, which might cost some money. Uh, so you may may decide not to do that, and that's a legitimate business reason to not bank a particular you know industry is because you don't have the expertise, nor are you interested in you know investing uh, money to to go get the expertise. Expertise. So those are all very valid reasons um, to, to not bank a particular industry. You know, I, I will mention that the OCC did issue um, an NPR related to what was called a fair access rule. Um, and I think that the gist of the rule was to, you know, tr try to say, uh, you know, all industries should have fair access and to, to the banking system, but and, and that, you know, there should be a prudent risk management system in place at certain institutions that determines, you know, what industries or, or how they manage the risk associated with certain industries. Now that 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 um, rule is on a, a prolonged pause and is lower on the counselor's priority list to. To potentially review, um, there you know there was a lot of public comments related to it, and it would take a very long time to go through them. But that was that was one of the that we did um, exclude community banks from that rulemaking in recognition of the fact that you know you're not going to be able to have you know expertise in all lines of business, and therefore you're going to have to make some judgment calls you know based on what types of industries and what businesses that you're willing to bank. So there was recognition in that rule, even though it's not going anywhere. Just so you understand our. Um, you know where we're coming from. That there is no expectation that community banks have to bank, you know, every everyone all the time, all industries. John, did that answer your question, or did you have a follow up on that topic? Well, maybe just maybe just a little bit of follow up. And thank you, and I appreciate the commentary about you know the free market piece here. I think the bigger concern was is if if we see this trend continue from a from a state standpoint. It's really putting us in a litigation issue or a potential litigation issue because we have conflicting state and, and federal laws, if you will, um, on that free access to, to the capital. And so I was just wanting to bring that to attention. I think that's um, going to get more challenging, not less challenging as we come forward. And that's just a John Coyne statement. 
Um, so recognizing that for what it is, but you know, any any eyes on that or or understanding um, to help in those situations, I think would be highly beneficial. So thank you very much. Um, the difference in the federal and state law here. It, it always raises the complexity level of um, applying applying rules and interpreting them. Another um, popular topic that has come up in some of our, our community bank outreach is really um, you know, more information on um, the OCC's approach with project reach and also the comptroller's priority of reaching underbanked uh, or unbanked individuals and what that means for community banks. And, and just for a moment, I'll speak as the deputy for thrift supervision, so in recognition that I don't have direct supervisory responsibility um, for thrifts under that under that top file, I really am more responsible for policy outreach um, and working closely with the regional advisory committee. Um, but one of the things we're going to be looking for um, is, is really buy-in from the, the community bank population, particularly neutral, on how um, how you can you know um, help to kind of close the gap in terms of reaching some of those populations. I know just anecdotally, several of you um, who are members of the mutual advisory committee have shared stories about how you are within your communities reaching out and um, you know exploring new opportunities for providing um, services to people who who wouldn't necessarily qualify under your existing policies and procedures. I think one of the examples that came up this morning was for people who didn't have social security numbers, who did have ITINs, and how you could adjust your, your business model to be able to bring them into the fold. Um, I think as Project REACH was announced um, as, the, as the economic kind of round table to discuss some of these issues, a lot of the focus was on um, large banks and, and collaborating with the minority deposit institutions that exist and finding ways to, to leverage mentor and to improve um, the ways that banks provide those services. But there is a critically important community bank aspect to the work that we're, that we're trying to accomplish when it comes to um, you know, diversifying who has access to the, the national banking and the federal savings association systems. In particular, play a key role on that. Um, you know, I think one of the arguments that's come up in some, several of the mutual savings association advisory committee meetings that mutuals really are, you know, the purest form of banking. When you're looking at, you know, um, political, um, you know, people talking about a public banking option through the post office or through other means, you know, mutuals would accomplish the same thing um, in, in the private sector, essentially allowing the banks to be owned by the members or the depositors. Um, in order to reach some of those communities, you actually do need mutual savings associations to step into that void, whether it means a de novo mutual stepping into the, the, the place that there is a, a, a banking desert, or whether it exists a community bank, um, whether mutual or stock form um, has the capacity to expand into those areas. We're looking for your ideas in that front. Um, so I'm curious as to whether or not you have found ways to intersect with Project REACH. Um, we're, we're planning on doing some more district-based outreach with community banks. Um, you know, Beverly being on the call is, is good because not only is she the, the deputy controller for the Northeast District, but she's also responsible for the Minority Depository Institution Advisory Committee, which is a, a group very similar to the Mutual Advisory Committee, um, comprised of bankers who are minority depository institution bankers who also advise us on topics um, relative to, to their specific representative sample of institutions. So, uh, Beverly, I don't know if you have anything you would like to add in terms of how um, Project REACH is working within the NBIT population or how um, we intend to continue to roll out the conversation amongst community bankers. I think that'll be a critical and great focus for us as an agency going forward. Yeah, thanks, Mike. No, this has been a, um, I think Project REACH, while it was the brainchild of uh, former acting comptroller Brian Brooks, uh, some of this effort really started with the MDIAC, our Minority Depository Advisory Committee, uh, years ago under uh, then Comptroller Curry. And really the, the main um, theme, I will say, for me was uh, that, one, the work that we do and that other in larger institutions do with the MDIs and smaller institutions is really about developing relationships because you do business with people that you have relationships with. You do transactions with people that you don't. And one of the um, concerns of the MDI population was that 
the larger institutions were not at the table. And so it was really about how we could go about bringing them to the table. And with, out of that, the idea of MDI collaboration meetings were born. Where we brought lar larger institutions together along with the MDIs. And actually, at some of the first meetings, the MDI population was very upset that we had brought the larger institutions to the meeting because they were still seeing each other as uh, competition and there was a lack of trust. So. Uh, as a regulator, we were very careful not to force any relationships or transactions or issues. And but I think over time, by bringing them together, um, they really kind of came to there was some common ground and some common goals, and that they could help each other. Because in business, both parties have to benefit, and so Project Reach was. Uh, an explosion, and some of that was, I think, the time timing of it, given what was going on in just society in general, but also the push that um, and importance that Acting Comptroller Brian Brooks placed on Project Reach and many of the projects, and then just bringing community leaders together, the bankers together, the MDIs, the larger institution bankers and their representatives together is really how we've kind of gotten to Project REACH now. Um, a lot of interest, and I think um, at some point there will be uh, opportunities or, you know, and Mike and I have kind of talked about this more informally than formally about how do we go about bringing other institutions into uh, a Project REACH type environment. And and that would definitely, for me, uh, I think we would want to include the mutuals in that. The other topic of conversation, kind of an offshoot of project reach discussions. Um, Charlotte Van and I, she's uh, Charlotte, you may agree with me. Advisor for Thrift Supervision have been uh, brainstorming and discussing kind of behind the scenes what it would take to charter new mutual savings association. It's a topic area that's been raised by the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee. Um, and, you know, by force of um, the economy and, and kind of exceeding demand, there have not been a lot of interest expressed in chartering the NOVOs. But it, it, the point of time that we are faced with where we have a, a definite need when it comes to banking minority communities, um, an incentive to try and charter additional minority depository institutions, I would constructively argue that the mutual form of charter is one of the best avenues in which you can actually reach minority populations, get their buy-in and investment in banking and their understanding and thinking to evolve. And that is an avenue that I would like to consider. Um, again, I think as we've talked through this as a, as a um, topic of discussion with the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee, we as the regulator um, have to do a self-assessment on impediments that we put in um, the way of de novo activity across all charter sites. Um, and so we're doing that kind of internal dialogue, discussing you know our standards for de novo chartering and what the limitations are. Obviously, there are some economic reasons why people choose stock institutions over mutual institutions when you're looking at it from the value um, from an investor's point of view. Um, so it is a different animal when you're talking about chartering a mutual when you're not looking at it for an immediate return on investment. You're looking at a longer term return on your investment in your community. We know there are some practical limitations. We know there are some structural limitations. Um, but it's a topic area that we are very keenly interested in exploring and discussing. Um, and it's one that, like I said, has surfaced at the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee. Um, various um, banking organizations have raised the topic with us. And it's one that we are actively engaged in. No promises to whether we reach a solution or whether we actually get an active um, charter application um, to consider and to, to work our way through that is obviously one of the more compelling reasons to answer the questions would be you actually have a lot of examples to, to think about. Um, I think it is time to be creative um, in terms of reaching that part of the industry. A, a huge population of people that have somehow been left out of the banking system. It's something I've been um, talking with my team about because I do wear two hats. I'm also responsible for special supervision, which is our problem bank unit. I think um, collectively in the problem bank side of our operation, we are very surprised that we have not seen an inflow of problem banks as a result of the year of unprecedented. 
unprecedented disruption in banking. Um, and largely it's because banks aren't taking the same degree of risk that they were taking 10 years ago. And potentially we fight our belt so much that we cause the exclusion of certain populations from the banking industry. Probably have not been witnessed before um, the last financial crisis. And so we have to understand what it means to bring those underbanked or unbanked people into the system, how to manage that risk, and, and how to balance that with the reward of getting people into the financial system. Help them build their life livelihood. So a lot of really difficult conversations that need to occur, um, conversations that I believe that we have um, from a policy perspective. And again, I'm speaking where I had someone who's not responsible for the direct supervision at this point of, of, of um, thrift that, that our district. Um, so as long as the industry is interested in us pursuing that, we want to hear feedback, we want to engage in that dialogue, and I would encourage you to your ideas. Um, again, we can't learn if we don't hear your perspectives and, and where you think there are some opportunities. So um, please continue to volunteer those. Again, through your members of the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee. Um, if you're not familiar, familiar with the, the 10 folks who, who currently represent the mutual industry, the Federal Mutual Savings Association, um, quite a few of them are, are um, all, actually all of them participated in today's forum, but quite a few of them helped moderate or sat on the panel discussion. Um, I, can, I can see uh, Anna and, and uh, George and Annette right now, so I know there, there are three of the folks who are, who are joining us on the video portion of today's chat who have been, been great representatives in this current term. Um, I would encourage you to get to know the members that are representing you. Um, obviously, I'm speaking to an audience of people who also are former representatives on the Mutual Savings Association Advisory Committee and have leveraged your participation on that group to continue to engage with us uh, going forward, even though your, your role has changed from what it was as a member of that committee to someone who is just a supervising institution within the framework. We value your input and would encourage that collaboration to continue. That's my sales pitch for you towards the back committee, um, reaching out to your committee members because they can represent you. Um, the idea is that they're representative members and they should share the ideas of their peers in addition to their own ideas. Um, so leverage um, you know, the introductions that were made as part of today's uh, forum. Um, if you didn't previously know one of the members of the advisory committee, still don't know them. Um, our website has a comprehensive list of all the biographies of the members so you can find the one who is closest to you or most representative of you. Mike, you're saying some really good stuff, but the static from the room, something is happening and you're, there's noise over you and you're cutting. Okay, I appreciate it. Is this any better? Much. <laughs> it helps when I turn on the right microphone. There's one about a foot away from me that was picking up everything I was saying as opposed to the one that was directly in front of my face. Okay. I apologize for that. So. Hopefully, hopefully you heard the bulk of what I just said, um, and if not, I, I don't have time to repeat it because that was a pretty long-winded comment. <laughs> but I assure you, it was it was brilliant. Uh, you know, so <laughs> um, it sounded so, brilliant. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, uh, so we've got about five minutes left, and so I, I wanted to, to one last time see if there are any questions, comments um, from the audience. I know um, you've been a little shy today, which is unexpected, but I know it is late in the day, um, and sometimes you get worn out after you spend an entire day participating in, in panel discussions. So um, I appreciate you sticking with us. We had about 56 people attending this session, which is a, a great turnout considering we only regulate 100 and, uh, just over 100 mutual savings associations, so a, a, a huge buy-in in terms of the importance of having these conversations. Um, but one thing I would request, again, of this group in particular is when you get your feedback survey from the FDIC, that you share with us your ideas of how we can do a better job with this forum in the future. Um, as, as I mentioned during the, the open session with all of the banks in attendance, um, you know, we've committed with the FDIC to biannually have the mutual joint forum, but we've also as, a, as an agency committed in those intervening years to host our OCC only version of the forum. And we will continue to do that as long as you continue to participate and, and show up. 
Um, you know, we're obviously going to going to have to make some decisions about whether we do the next forum in person or whether we do it virtually. Um, our our lesson learned is that virtually we tend to get more participation, but obviously you lose out on the networking and the the, the ability to talk and communicate with your peers. Um, so we we want to hear from you on what your preference is. Do you prefer having more people attend in a virtual environment, or do you prefer um, us retreating to a little bit more of a, a traditional face-to-face -face meeting in the future with a, with a subset of the mutual population to have a little bit more of a dialogue in person. So um, if you want to share that with us as well, we would really appreciate that as, as feedback as, um, as you consider you know, um, and look back on, on the things you heard today or learned today as part of today's forum. So is that Mike, is there, is, there, is there a third way, a, a bifurcated system where you can have people in the room and also have a simulcast with a, a virtual audience? Yeah, so we've we've talked about that as well, and to try and explore how we can we can essentially publish certain of the sessions for the web for anyone who wants to participate. The other thing that we've we've considered is, you know, typically these forums are are geared towards senior executives, so directors, CEOs of the mutual savings associations. But in recognition that succession planning is critically important, and that you may want to bring multiple people to these forums so they can also hear the conversation, they can interact and learn. Um, if we have a hybrid, where we do some virtual and some in person where some of you can afford to travel and others of you can just dial in for the experience. Um, we can certainly explore that as an, as an option as well. Um, again, it's about striking the right balance between, um, you know, I, I know having been, you know, one of the remote participants in a, in a virtual session where there's a camera pointed at a table of 10 people on a panel, you really don't get a lot out of that. You can't see facial expression. You don't get to necessarily get the body language or the intuitive kind of things you would get if you were sitting there in person. So the hybrid ones are challenging in and of themselves themselves, but we can certainly do that, um, you know, if that's a, a preference of, of the folks in attendance today for us to continue to kind of bridge the gap and get as many attendees as possible and kind of get the best of both worlds. All right, with that, we are about two minutes from the natural conclusion of today's event, so I will just thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, we look forward to having an active dialogue with you all um, going through the remainder of 2021. It's hard to believe in a couple days we will be at the end of the second quarter and we will be halfway through the year. Um, it's, it's shocking how quickly this one is flying by. Um, it's probably because we're, we're all going out and, and enjoying ourselves far more than we did in the past, so it seems like time is just speeding along. Um, but I do look forward to seeing many of you in person as we, as we reconvene convene over the, the rest of this year and into next year. Um, and I appreciate, again, the commitment that the Mutual Advisory Committee members have, have, uh, have, have shown, um, particularly with today's events, um, joining in on the panel discussions and helping to moderate and or be on the panels. I know that's a lot of work and preparation, and I know the, the, the nerves and the um, anxiety that goes into that as well. So I do appreciate your, your commitment um, in the role today. So thank you for your time, and, uh, and we will uh, adjourn for today, and we will um, talk again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.